Now, in Matthew 22, we have been studying a little bit. I did not intend to do this, but we've been studying again in the life of David. And I've been there a good while. And I want us to just spend a moment or two, not, not very long. I don't think it'll take very long. I want us to have a little Bible study tonight from the life of David. And we're going to look in Matthew chapter 22, and we're going to start reading in verse number 41. Matthew chapter 22 and verse number 41. And the Bible said, While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord? Saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word. Neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. I can understand that, can't you? Now, I notice when we read this passage that the, the Lord Jesus is establishing His deity. He is telling them that He is more than a man. When we look at this passage, we find that Jesus was before David. There is the antiquity of the Savior. And then we will find in this passage that the Lord was begotten of David. Here is the accuracy of the Scriptures. Then we will find, if we think about this a little bit, that the Lord was beyond David. He was above and after David. There is the authority of His sovereignty. Jesus is establishing in this passage that He was before David and above David and after David. Maybe that's why Revelation 22 will say, I, Jesus, have sent Mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star. He is telling us that He is deity. One writer wrote it this way. He said, nor is there any way of answering this question, but by the admission that the Messiah was divine as well as human. That He had an existence at the time of David, and was His Lord and Master, His God and King, and that as man He was descended from from him. Now Jesus asked this question and they give him this answer. He said, what think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? And they say unto him, and here's this little phrase I'm interested in, thou son or the son of David. Jesus is known throughout this New Testament as the son of David. That's a very interesting phrase. I want to preach a little while, a little while on David and the Christ. Now there's another man in the Bible who is referenced as the son of David. His name is Joseph. It's interesting that though he was not the father of Christ, he was intricately connected with Christ. But his title son of David is different. He is the son of David by his birth as a Jew. But what he is not is the root of David. Je Jesus is not only the son of David, he is the root of David. He was not only after David, he was before David. I wrote it down this way in my notes. He is David's sovereign and and David's son. He is David's heritage and David's hope. He is David's deity and David's descendant. He was before David and begotten of David. He instituted David's throne and he inherited David's throne. And so I want to remind you now that Jesus did not begin to exist at Bethlehem. He has always been. As a matter of fact, in Isaiah, the Bible talked about that child that would be born, that son that was given. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. Jesus always has been God and always will be God. You can find him in the Old Testament and find him throughout the New Testament. Sometimes you have to look a little bit. I remember years ago, Dr. Harold Seitler preaching. And I'll be honest with you, I don't remember the sermon that he preached. I don't remember exactly what it was, all that he said, but I remember him saying this. You know, he preached 
that kind of gravelly voice and he'd throw his finger up in the air and raise his voice when he wanted to make a point. And I remember him saying this. He said, when you read your Bible, look for Jesus. You'll find him on every page. And I believe that's true. Jesus said this, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. And so the whole Bible is about Jesus. Now they asked him about this phrase Jesus did about this title the son of David. He was establishing his deity and he made reference to an Old Testament verse. I want you to look at it with me. The 110th Psalm and I want to spend a moment or two, just a moment or two in this little passage Psalm 110 and I want to read the passage that Jesus quoted establishing his deity. Psalm 110 and verse 1. The superscription says, a psalm of David. And then he said this, the Lord, now that Lord, notice it's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That is the name of God, Jehovah, that holy name. And so the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy Footstool. Now I'm interested in this verse. I'm interested in it for several reasons tonight. I'm interested in it because we've already talked about the deity of Christ that is established in this verse. He has always been. He never had a beginning. As a matter of fact, the Bible said in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. Genesis 1 we talked about this the other night that God created in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth now one writer said this about that he said Genesis 1 1 begins with the story of creation but John 1 1 begins with the account of the creator Jesus is God and he is the creator by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God now I shouldn't get off on this but let me say this I get in Hebrews chapter 11 the the giants of the faith, the heroes of the faith, by faith Abel, by faith Enoch, by faith Noah, by faith Abraham, and on and on. And they did mighty deeds and they're recorded in Hebrews chapter 11. But did you know, now you, you probably didn't notice it when you read it, reading through your Bible, but did you know that I am in Hebrews 11? Did you know that? I am one of those heroes of the faith. You know why? Because the Bible says, by faith we understand. Now it said, by faith Noah did this. By faith Moses did that. By faith Abraham did this. By faith Joshua did that. But it also said, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. I believe that. I'm there in Hebrews chapter 11. If you believe it, you're in there too. Amen. We belong in there. And so, uh, we have, I don't know how that got in there, but it got in there somehow but Jesus made the world now I want us to go back to this Psalm 110 and I want us to just see three things quickly from this Psalm that might be of help to us in a practical manner now I got looking at this Psalm because I'm studying David and studying about his relationship to Christ and so he said this David said this by the Spirit of God he said the Lord said unto my Lord Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now I'm looking at this verse and I'm noticing that there are four words in this verse that imply possession. I'm not very good at English. You could tell that when I preach. So I don't know if they are possessive pronouns or possessive adjectives. I don't know. I think they're one of those two. I'm not positive. But they do show possession. Now look at it. The Lord said unto, here's the first one, my Lord. Not just any Lord, but my Lord. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand. Not just anybody's right hand but my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So you have four words here that deal with possession. Now, we look in this passage and we say, all right, 
Jesus' deity. And, and John, uh, 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 David is talking about it here. But what does it have to do with me? Well, I want to talk about what I possess in Christ according to this verse. I am in possession of some very wonderful and precious things that are found in this verse. Here's the first one. There are three of them. I want you to notice, first of all, when I read this verse, I'm reminded that I'm in possession of personal access to God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We could call it our intimacy with God. The Lord says unto my Lord. Now, here's what you have in this verse. You have communion. You have God. God in communion with the Lord. Now, the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, that's Jehovah. That is, the, that is the Father in the Godhead. And then my Lord, notice, is capital L, but little O-R-D. That's Adonai. That is somebody who was higher in authority than David was. Now, David was the king of Israel. I don't reckon there was any man in Israel that was of higher authority than David. So he's not talking about a man. He's talking about somebody who is beyond a man and above a man and has more authority than a man. You see, David has seen here by the Spirit of God uh, two persons of the Godhead and possibly three because somebody revealed it to him. Amen. And so you have God the Father in communion with God the Son. But David just doesn't say the Lord Jehovah spoke to the Lord Adonai. He said the Lord Jehovah spake to my Lord Adonai. David said there's communion going on in heaven but said I'm part of it I'm in communion with the Father and with the Son I want to say to you today because of what Christ did when he came and was born of a virgin and lived a perfect life and died on the cross and rose again because of that I am in possession of access to God the Father there is one God and one mediator between men and God the man Christ Jesus and the very moment that I took Christ as my Lord and my Savior in Immediately, I had access to the throne of God. You have access to the throne of God tonight. We can be intimate in our relationship with God. We can know what He's like. We can know what He wants. We can hear. You ever heard His voice? Amen. Has He ever spoken to you and directed you? Have you ever got in your prayer closet and just fellowship with Him a little while? I'm glad that I am in possession of access to the Father. If we read what Ephesians said, if you'd like to turn there with me, I'll read you a few verses from Ephesians chapter number 1 because it has a great deal to say about this. Ephesians, if I can find it in my Bible, I know it's in here. Ephesians chapter number 1, beginning in verse number 15, the Bible will say this. It will say, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him, that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us word, who believe according to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead, and set Him, now listen to this, set Him at His own right hand in heavenly places. We're going to come back to that in a moment. He set him at his own right hand in heavenly places far above principality and power and might and dominion and every man that is named not only or named that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come. Now he said he set him in heavenly places. But wait a minute now. I will be told also in Ephesians 2 that I in, in Ephesians that I have been set in heavenly places. He has set us in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. So what he's saying is the communion that Jesus has with the Father you and I also have with the Father in Christ. We have communion with Him. In Ephesians 2, the Bible said, For through Him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. You know why we're so disturbed? 
You know why we're so discontented? You know why we're so discouraged? Because we're not taking advantage of our access. We're not taking advantage of the throne of God. We have forgotten that we have a mediator. And we've tried to work things out in our own strength and our own power. But tonight I am in possession of a great treasure. I have access into the very throne room of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm in possession of personal access through Christ. But then I want you to notice something else it says in this verse. It says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand. Now God the Father said to God the Son. You say, can you explain it? No, but I believe it. The Godhead. The Trinity. God the Father said to God the Son, Sit thou at my right hand right hand you know that's a place of honor but the bible said blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in christ which he wrought in christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places but then in chapter 2 and verse 6 and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus now the first thing we look at is my that my Lord that tells us about our intimacy with God but this my throne my right hand tells us about our security I am in possession of positional access Here's what I mean. The moment I was saved, I sat down with Jesus at the right hand of the throne of God in my position. God looks at me. Who does he see? He sees Jesus. I'm positionally secure. in. Christ. I may not always act like it. And I may not always have the joy that I ought to have in it. And I may not always live like it. But I'm always right there positionally secure in Christ. It don't matter what the devil tells me. It don't matter what my friends tell me. It doesn't matter what my own flesh tells me sometime. On March the 10th of 1980, 11 o'clock on a Saturday night, I became positionally secure in Christ. I became seated in the heavenlies. The old King's Travelers, you remember Brother Joe, Brother Ledbetter, the King's Travelers, they used to sing this song. I'm already over on the other side just waiting on my body to be. And that's exactly what's true with us. We are already there. Somebody said, preach. Are you going to heaven? Yep. John already saw me there over in Revelation chapter 4, gathered around the throne. I'm already seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You know what we ought to do? We ought to start acting like it. We ought to start rejoicing in the fact that we're safe and secure in the Lord Jesus. You say, well, preacher, are you going to lose your salvation if God the Father and God the Son have a fallen out? If they have a disagreement... And Jesus is no longer accepted. I'm in trouble. The Bible said I'm accepted in the beloved. But they've gone on this far without having a fallen out. I don't think they'll have a fallen out. Do you? I think I'm safe forever. Safe and secure in Christ. I've got some more verses on that. But I'm going to hurry on. I'm going to. Here's the third thing I want you to see. I want you to see not only that I have a personal access, I'm in possession of it, and I'm in possession of polit- positional access, but here's the last thing I want you to see. I'm in possession of powerful access through Christ. Not only my intimacy with God and my security with God, but my victory in God. Now listen to what else he said in our song. We're talking about these personal, whatever they are, pronouns, adjectives, you English teachers can tell me later. Then the Lord said unto my Lord, there's my intimacy, sit thou at my right hand, there's my security, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now, the Lord said, the Lord said to my Lord, you just sit here and I'm going to take care of this. And I'm going to make your enemies your footstool. Now he's making reference to the Old Testament. He's making reference to where Joshua uh, told his men to put his 
feet on the heads, the necks of those kings. He's talking about when somebody who is against you has been conquered and put down. They've been, a, they've been a thorn in your flesh. They've tried to keep you from doing what God would have you to do. But there's going to come a day when he's going to make the enemies of Christ his footstool. You know what a footstool is. You sit down in your chair and there's that footstool. You rest your feet on it. It doesn't tell you what to do. You tell it what to do. It doesn't tell you where it's going to sit. You tell it where it's going to sit. It's not in charge. You're in charge. That's what God the Father, Jehovah is going to do with the enemies of Christ. But wait a minute now. Since I am in Christ and He's in me since I'm seated in heavenly places with Christ, His enemies have become my enemies. And so what God is going to do is he's going to put you. Say, well, preacher, it don't look that way. It don't matter how it looks, friend. It matters what the scripture says. That God, the Father, will take the enemies of Christ and put them down. Amen. We will have victory. The contenders and the conquered. Now, I want to show you something and I'll be done. If you'd hang on just for a moment. In Matthew is where we find this phrase repeated, Son of David. Over and over again. I think I read nine times. And one of those times, it is in reference to the same circumstance, so we might say, on eight different occasions, we read about the Son of David. Christ is the Son of David in the book of Matthew. Now the first one is in Matthew 1.1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Here's an introduction to him. The next seven are interesting. And they're interesting for this reason. Every one of them, every time the son of David comes up, two things are involved. You know what's involved? There is contention by the religious rulers against him. And there are the helpless who need to be healed. Every time Son of David comes up, there's somebody fighting Christ and somebody needing Christ. Somebody trying to stop Him and somebody trying to get to Him. Every time. It's in the context around it. Now, let me read them to you and I'll read them in a hurry. In the first, this first one after Matthew 1.1 1, 1, is Matthew 9.27. And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. In Matthew 12.22, Then were brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb. And he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? Matthew 15, 22. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. A little bit later, just a few verses later, the great multitudes come to him and they see him healing the blind and the dumb and the lame. In Matthew 5, chapter 20 and verse 30. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebuked him, because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. The sixth one is Matthew 21, 9. And the mul listen to this now. And the multitudes went before him and followed crying, saying, Hosanna, be the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And if you'll read the context, the Pharisees were upset about him, told him to tell, he told Jesus, tell him not to praise you like that. Tell him not to say that. Then in Matthew 7, listen to this now. Matthew 7, verse 21, 14. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. Now we didn't read every aspect of the Pharisees against him, but I want you to notice this one. I want you to notice this particularly. We just read it. Look at, if you have your Bible, Matthew 21, verse 14. Listen to it now. And the blind 
and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Now, with that verse in your mind, look at 2 Samuel, chapter number 5. David has been anointed king, but he has not established his authority, and he's not taken all of the capital city yet. And in 2 Samuel 5 and verse 6, the Bible said, And the king... And his men went to Jerusalem under the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither. Thinking, David cannot come in hither. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, the same as the city of David. They said to David, you can't be king here because you can't take away the blind and the lame. But when the son of David came on the scene, he did what his father David could not do. He took away the blind and the lame. But then it's not done yet now. Watch it now. And David said on that day, see, here's what the Jebusites are saying to David. They're saying, if all we had were blind men and lame men, you couldn't get up here. You couldn't conquer them. And so David said in verse 8, whoever getteth up to the gutter and smiteth the Jebusites and the lame and the blind that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Wherefore, they said, listen to it now, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. I want you to think about this. David was a great man. David was a wonderful man. But under David, the blind and the lame could not be taken away. They couldn't even come in the house. They couldn't even come in. But when the greater son of David came along, Jesus, not only did he take the blind and the lame away, the Bible said he did it when they came into the temple. You see, David could not have saved us. David could not have helped us. David could not have given us the possession that we have. But the greater son of David, Jesus Christ, has come. And he's taken away my lameness. And he's taken away my blindness. And he's given me the wonderful possession of access into the very throne room of God he is the son of David and he's the son of David that we need the last time it's mentioned the last time it's mentioned but the eighth time which is the number of new beginnings Matthew 22 and verse 42 saying what think ye of Christ I'd like to ask you tonight what think ye of Christ whose son is he oh he is the son of David He's also the son of Jehovah God. He's also God manifest in the flesh. And I'll tell you what he does tonight. He gives me access. I'm in possession of access to the throne. I'm in possession. I'm in possession of security. I'm secure in Christ. And I'm in possession of power. I can go to the throne. And I can through my mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ, come boldly on the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Why? Because of the son of David. And what? he did for me on the cross of Calvary I'm glad he came let's pray father we love you tonight and we thank you for loving us and I pray you bless the man of God as he comes in Jesus name amen